How did the finish Who go? Who am I talking to? Uh, Brian Covelloworthy. Welcome to the Velloworthy podcast. And if you stick around till the end of the show, we'll reveal who that writer was who was very concerned about who he was talking to. Yes, we've covered a lot of things, but one of the things we get excited about every year is the Amgen Tour of California. That is a huge bike race. It's a UCI bike race that is the only one in North America, and it comes right to California. This year, it started in Sacramento and worked its way south all the way to Pasadena, California. It featured a men's and women's race. For the men, it had seven stages. For the women, it had three, but we're hoping we can get more than three by next year. And it featured a star-studded peloton in both the men's and women's. You could probably tell by the sound of my voice that I'm a little sick. And unfortunately, it's not the best time to podcast, but we want to get this show to you. Before we do that, though, I want to hear from you. Best thing to do, brian at veloworthy.com. Give us some feedback. Don't forget to rate, subscribe, and review on Apple Podcasts as well. That helps with allowing other people to find the podcast a little bit organically. There's a lot more podcasts now than there were when I started and even just a year ago, especially cycling podcasts. So that is one of the best things to do. We would really appreciate it. So don't be afraid to write in. We're going to actually start the show today with a little bit of listener feedback. We did this in the first season. We're going to continue to do that again. So let's go ahead and get started with the first one. And this first one comes into us from Instagram. And don't forget, on Instagram, I'm at Veloworthy. It says, hey, Brian, I just wanted to say that the first episode of your new season, in parentheses, and new brand was great. Helped with my BWR FOMO. That comes from former podcast guest Robin Carpenter. And by the way, Robin, if you're listening, I think he's one of the few people who can actually, if he ever decides to do BWR one of these years, he could win it. He's a pro for rally cycling, one of the strongest Americans out there. And he just took it upon himself to uh, write in and tell me that he liked the show, which is always great to hear, especially because I'm such a fan of Robin's. It's uh, kind of this cool respect that uh, he gave me. But Let's go ahead and get started with the episode, the tour of California. So we were in Sacramento and the first person we interviewed is probably the least well-known out of our bunch that we talked to. Her name is Kristen Klein and there would not be a Amgen tour of California without her. And the reason why is she's the president of the tour of California. So she makes everything happen from the logistics to the staff, to the press conferences, to the route info. Everything you can think of has to go through her. So let's go ahead and hear from her. We are so excited to kick it off here in Sacramento. Um, This is the longest race uh, to date. We have probably the most competitive field, not only from a sprinter standpoint, but also from a general classification. Um, But today in Sacramento, you're going to see a sprinter showdown right at the finish. So, you know, we'll see if Mark can, you know, can uh, can win his, his fifth stage here. Um, but then, you know, of course, we have some of those other top sprinters here, uh, like uh, Peter Sagan and um, Dagen Kalb. So it's going to be it's going to be an exciting day today. So this race has been going on for many years. It's it's sort of the face of, of American cycling. How is this year's? sort of iteration different from last year or in years past? Yeah, I mean, we, you know, like anything, we continue to get better every year. You know, we learn. um, And you know what? It's it's nice that the teams, the riders, I mean, this race is important. Not only is it the biggest race in America, and it's only World Tour race for both men and women, but we're also one of the biggest races in the world. Next up, we go to the CCC team and talk to Simon Geschke. He's a German rider who's won a stage in the Tour de France before. You might recognize him as kind of the most handsome bearded man in cycling. He's got his perfectly manicured beard. Uh, he's a powerhouse rider. He can he's, he can win on flat to lumpy stages. We went ahead and we spoke to him before the start. Yeah, a bit excited because I had a long break. Uh, I was injured second time this year and... Uh, and also because it's my first tour of California, and uh, I heard a lot of good things about it. Well, what kind of ride are you expecting for this week? It finishes on Mount Baldy. That's the big climbing stage, no time trial, flat today. You've won on climbs. You've also done well on flats. What, what are you expecting for today and this week? 
Oh, you too, for today uh, it's a clear sprint stage and there are a lot of sprinters here, a lot of good sprinters, so uh, it will be a bunch sprint and it's good to get into into the racing. Um, uh, yeah, and then there's a lot of climbing to come this week, so um, it will definitely be not a lucky winner of the GC and um, yeah, I think it's, it will be a very exciting week racing. Are you saving yourself for the Baldi stage? No, I uh, I couldn't uh, really perform on the highest level yet because uh, whenever I raced, I crashed and I uh, broke something. So that is my first race back now after the uh, after a broken collarbone and also I broke seven ribs. So I will see how I how I feel day by day. But uh, I, I'm not thinking about the GC at all. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, he's just waiting. With recovery from a broken collarbone and seven ribs, as he just mentioned. Simon Geschke is a powerhouse of a person. He finished 39th, 2156 behind. And in throughout some of the stages, he was definitely going on the attack, being in the wind, working for other riders. So I can't imagine the kind of pain he put himself through, and probably the others as well. Uh, next up, we go to Team USA. So this is kind of an interesting uh, concept. It's a composite team made up of the top USA riders. So it's sort of like the dream team, but for American cyclists who don't have their own team that qualified for the Tour of California because it is a UCI race. So it was a mixture of some really great riders. We talked to the director sportif of Team USA, Mike Sayers, who in his own right, he rode for Mercury, BMC. He, he rode for many teams and has had many victories uh, and now is in a leadership role. So we went ahead and spoke with him. Well, we're, we're really looking at it as uh, seven independent races um, because I think GC is a little bit outside of our reach and it's really not appropriate, I think, for guys at this level to kind of bring them in and then put this big expectation on them that they're going to ride GC. So we would rather go day by day. Um, ultimately, these guys are here to learn, get some experience, and maybe make an impact because most of the directors in this race can, are going to be their future employers. So it's really an opportunity for them. Uh, we ask that they do the most with their opportunity. And beyond that, you know, we're going to try to create a support network, which we have, um, that will support them as best they can from day to day. And hopefully some good things will happen. Is it hard because these guys are not teammates? I mean, three of them are on the same team, Avolo, but the rest of them are a little bit more coming from different areas and they, they haven't raced as a team together. Does that make things more difficult for you? Um, well, it's a different challenge, but uh, I, I ran the national team for five years and I'm very comfortable with kind of explaining the situation. Ultimately, these guys... You know they do race against each other but they're all supportive of each other and it, it is a situation where this is this could or may not be the only time there's world championships there's olympic games and yeah we're not maybe we're not talking about the 2020 olympics but there's plenty of olympic games after that and you, you have to you have to know how to to put your differences aside and and ride as a team i mean our objective is the same and if it on a climbing day there's guys who climb and on a sprinting day there's days that, there's guys who sprint and no one is crossing over so everyone needs to chip in and we just create a very positive environment here I've always tried to do that and the staff is always very helpful everyone gets treated equally and yeah that's just kind of how we do it let's talk about your ideal scenario for this race what does that look like for the team and you if you if it could go perfectly what would that look like uh, today or in Just general? Today and in general. I think uh, in general it would be great if we could uh, capitalize on the under-23 jersey. I think it would be awesome if we could get to a point where we had a guy in a podium every couple days, whether it's from most aggressive or whether it's from under-23 or a sprint jersey. Um, if we could, I think if we could leave this race at the end of the week with everybody riding to their maximum, and possibly creating some opportunities for our guys, I think that would be a very, very successful week for us. All right, Mike Sayers, Team USA, thank you so much. You're welcome, thank you. Stage one started in Sacramento at the state capitol, and the usual Dave Tal and Brad Schoner took over as they energized the crowd right before the start. But before we get to that, we gotta sort things out here in Sacramento for stage one of the Engine Tour of California. Let's start to make some noise in downtown Sacramento.
after stage one, we headed back to Southern California to cover the later two stages. Uh, it was something that was a race within a race because the fans, the journalists, they have to do a lot to access the writers. And for me, it was really difficult going up to a writer that was already crowded with people. If you see a little kid going up to get an autograph, I, I let the kid go. And then another kid and another kid and another kid. And by at a certain point, the writers are wanting to get on the buses, they're tired, and so you do have to sort of jostle your way into position to talk to the writers, and when you do, you hope they can say something worthwhile. At the start of the stage in Ontario to Baldy, we talked with the second half of the Team USA uh, leadership, Mike Creed, who runs the Avolo team. And now you're with USA Cycling. I interviewed Sayers at the start of stage one. I asked him what would make for a perfect race, and it seems like you guys are not just in it, you're making the race happen. Yeah, you know, we uh, definitely front-ended this race with... No, don't say that by yourself. You're nice. You're thin. No, it's too much weight. You'll be too skinny then. Um, yeah, no, we definitely, we definitely front-ended this race with... Uh, the effort, you know, and uh, the guys are definitely paying for it now, but if we would have, you know, just saw in the future and said, oh, well, you know, we'll have, at one point your riders will win every jersey except the yellow jersey, we would have counted as a successful race. We would have signed on the dotted line right there for it, right? So, like, I don't think... Um, the fact that we did it all in the first three or four days and now the guys are paying a little bit for those efforts you can't like forget that and just because if the guys are tired now like uh, i feel like the race went bad but so uh, i think we're still in a really good spot yeah does it help that a lot of the guys are from your own avolo team and then you know the rest are strong in their own disciplines uh Help in what way, you mean? Like help in terms of like working together as a team, uh, tactics? Yeah, I mean, um, maybe a little bit because then it's more comfortable for me. But the riders are, I mean, if you're going to make the national team for Tour of California, you're probably pretty dang decent anyway. The fact that they're teammates uh, is, it probably helps, you know, make the group dynamic solidify pretty quick. But they all know each other anyway, and they're, they're all somewhat friendly, so... It helps, but probably probably don't want to overstate how much it helps. Right. Gotcha. I mean, the fact that they're on a ball just generally just means that they're probably badasses, right? And that, badasses anyway. Yeah. On top so of like that's just like circumstance. <laughs> awesome. What are you predicting for today's stage at Baldy? You know, I don't know. I think um, there's teams that it's obviously the last GC uh, fight. I feel like you know you have a team like a uh, Astana. Um, uh who maybe have a few guys in the top 10 so maybe one guy's gonna go a little early not save it for the final climb because it's pretty easy to kind of neutralize that you need a little element of chaos so going early kind of helps that so yeah it'd be interesting to see if any of the potential gc guys who may be in the like 40 second window 30 second window go early and make a race of it otherwise you know if that doesn't happen, it might just be a standard affair of guys, you know, five, ten minutes down, you know, going early, and then they just haul, haul ass up the final climb. Getting on TV. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. I don't know if you heard Mike Creed at the start of the interview, but he was, uh, obs we were both observing a, a elderly man who rode his bike, as most people should, to a bike race but then talking about himself to the mechanics who are already busy working on stuff. The last, here's a pro tip, everybody, pro tip. If you ride your bike to a professional bike race, do not go up to the pro mechanics and start asking them questions about how to fix your bicycle. They are extremely busy and they don't want to be jerks about it. Uh, they're friendly, but uh, you know, you don't go to a NASCAR race and ask them to change your oil on your car that you drove in on. So please be respectful of uh, the staff, the mechanics. They're there for the riders first and the public second. And uh, I don't know, go to your local bike shop, have your local mechanic work on that. Uh, next up, we, uh, we go to the start line and we hear Dave Tal talk to some of the contenders of the Mount Baldy stage as babies cry in the background. 
to, to the maximum of their ability day in and day out, and you know, it's really paid off. I think that's what's great about this, is seeing all these young Americans, our friends from USA Cycling, <laughs> all remember your days back here when you were Michael Hernandez, or whatever it might be on that US national team, come a long way. Last question for you, you feeling okay? I saw the crash, you flip over pretty hard. Uh, again, uh, amazing what you guys go through out here. You look awesome, how are you feeling? Yeah, I feel good. Um, you know, obviously I would have preferred not to have crashed, but... Uh, Ideally. <laughs> yeah, but all things considered, it's okay, you know, just uh, I, I heard you were a little dinged up. Yeah, just, but you know, tape it up and it's fine. I mean, that's that's how I fix everything at home. I just duct tape it, so, you know, the wrist, no different. You need your old buddy Chris uh, Stockwater to tape you up. Yeah, I know. He was texting me uh, last night just saying, hey, if you need an ortho console, tell the team to fly me out. And I was like, yeah. Heck yeah. Yeah, it'd be cool to hang out with him. Right on, TJ. Good luck. Good to see your smile. That's your little race leader, Jersey. That's TJ Van Garderen. Well, all right. Uh, Keel, Ryan, we're going to have Keel managing quite a few things. I know Keel has some family coming down from Washington State. Keel, you might have a special guest. Do you mind introducing me to you? Uh, to your friend who's maybe the cutest uh, person we've ever had on this stage. And what is the uh, duck's name or the chicken's name? What's your chick's name? I wouldn't answer either. Hey, who is your friend? This is my daughter, Amy Lou, and she's a big fan of bike racing. Mostly the pink bus, though. I bet I get it. Yeah, so, well, I see the gear. So, uh, hard time getting her to support dad's team. The process for the riders and at the beginning of every stage is they arrive on the team buses or in a lot of cases rented RVs because the European teams like Bora and Quickstep and Katusha, they can't take their buses from Europe on a boat. It's just too impractical. So what they do is they, when they get to the United States, they rent an RV for the week. And the only way you know that that is the team is they have one of those like magnets unless your team Ineos, they can actually wrap afford to wrap their RVs around with their team logos. And the American teams such as Rally and EF, they already have team buses here. So those riders get off the bus and the and the more famous riders like Sagan, they get swarmed with people. They head to the start. They sign in on the ceremonial surfboard. They get to the stage. The race announcer usually pulls aside a few of the favorites and talks to them, interviews them. Then after they sign in, they get back down. They sign a few autographs, and then they have bike valets that hold onto their bikes while they're up on stage, and then they're matching the bike number with their race number. In the meantime, there's tons of fans, tons of media trying to get pictures, trying to get quotes, and then they make their way back to the bus. And then from that, it's pretty much standard stuff. I've, I saw people stretching. I saw people you know, downing gels and, and some hydration. Mechanics are working on bikes, and when they're not working on bikes, they're standing there watching them, making sure nobody takes them. So it's a little bit of controlled chaos. But you know, these races they start in random parking lots of places and in, in big areas, just like any other USA Cycling race or a local criterium. So it, on that sense, it's somewhat familiar. So navigating the the craziness i was able to to talk to a few more writers one of them is for for whatever reason my personal favorite he is sort of the super domestique of bora and right hand man to peter sagan uh, daniel oss the tall italian who has done the tour of california before today uh it's baldy today it's definitely a climbing stage how are you feeling and how are you feeling for the team yeah, definitely tired. <laughs> After this this week is really tough. I mean, we did already four days in a row, more than 200k, and today is the day. Actually, no, today is the dia, and we'll see. I mean, today our climber feel good, and we are in the really good position to do the race. So we just do our best. I mean, everything is going in the right direction. Do you have a certain plan for the? For once you hit Baldi, or yeah, before we don't have a, the, the team to to do the real, uh, I mean, the, some, something that that means we have to also check what um, other teams with more climbers in the team mm -hmm. they are doing. So maybe the first part we have to control a bit and be in the in the, in the mood, <laughs> <laughs> and then for sure the last the last climb is 
uh, all for the climbers for sure. Have you done Baldi before? Yeah, yeah, many times. So you know it? Yeah, I know it. I know it will be hard. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Ciao. Ciao. Daniel Oss went on to finish in 72nd place, almost an hour down behind the winner, uh, which we'll, we'll, we'll get to. The other rider and quite possibly crowd favorite. He's a green jersey points winner. He finished third overall in GC, and he won stage two. His name's Casper Azagreen of the Dunnes at Quick Step team, and we talked to him. How are the legs feeling today for Baldy? Oh, I hope they feel good. It's uh, been a long uh, race, four days with 200-plus kilometers, so I think everybody's going to feel the legs at this point. Do you have a plan to hang on to the green jersey till tomorrow? You know, I have uh, Sagan breathing down my neck. Uh, I've, I'm pretty sure he's going to give me a hard time hanging on to it, so we'll see how it goes. All right, thank you very much. Of course. And one of the lesser-known writers, but SoCal resident, local, and friend to Joe J. Bars. His name's Sam Boardman. He rides for the Wildlife Generation team, but also for this race, rode for the Team USA composite team. Yeah. Sam Boardman, big day today for Baldy. How are you feeling? Uh, I guess I'm ready to just get the day started. You know, waiting around. None of us like doing that, so we just want to get going. But it's nice that we get to sleep in a little bit till 7:30 today. So you got your Joe J bar in hand. I got my Joe J bar in hand. Yeah, I'm taking a little munch. Of That's gonna help you get up the climbs today. Yeah, I think so. Well, pancakes and bacon fuel right now, just to get me through the morning. Good luck, brother. Thank you so much. So that is a tough, tough day ahead. Unfortunately for me, I was so sick. I could not make it up to the top of the mountain. The logistics of it was just too insane. So the way it works is uh, they don't allow cars to go up. So the only way to get up there is if you're a devoted fan is to ride your bike up or camp out. That's pretty much your only two options. Me being a journalist, I can take the shuttle. And the problem is with the shuttle, it's a one way up and then a one way down. So if you miss the bus back, the shuttle back, uh, you're walking down that mountain. And I looked at the time and it went back after 5 p.m. So long after the stage because they have press conferences and they have to gather things and break, break everything down. And then the last shuttle goes when they reopen the road. So I figured, you know, it was up at the top of the mountain. The people that were up there, it was really cold, almost freezing cold. And uh, I was just way too sick to do that. So I definitely regret uh, missing it. I saw it on TV, which which is the way most people see it. And it's a little bit more comfortable. The American fans, while what they lack in numbers compared to the European fans on a mountain stage, they make up for an enthusiasm. Of course, there was a cookie corner and a few standouts in their uh, costumes that look like Halloween out there. But the last day of the tour of California went from Santa Clarita to Pasadena. The person who took yellow was Tade Pojakar. You don't know his name yet. Maybe you do right now because he is a phenom. He is the youngest person to win a UCI World Tour race. He's the youngest person in the race. He's only 20 years old, not old enough to buy a beer, but old enough to win a bike race against some of the best in the entire world. And if you look at the trajectory of Tour of California, it seems to suit and really bring out the best in the young talents. Last year, Egon Bernal won at 21 years old, taking on some of the favorites. Nobody knew who he was before the Tour of California. Everybody knew who he is after. In the Tour de France later, Bernal dropped Chris Froome on on some of the mountain stages and sort of waited to pace him back up. Uh, And for this guy, Tade Pojakar, it's hard to pronounce his name. He's Slovakian. Uh, he rides for the UAE team. He went into the last stage in yellow and held on, and he is a rider that's going to be watched for many years to come. So in Pasadena, it goes around the Rose Bowl for the last three laps. And the cool thing about that is it basically mimics the world famous Rose Bowl ride. If you've ever been to the Rose Bowl or LA or a cyclist in LA, you know about the Rose Bowl ride. It's older than most cyclists and it's a very simple but tried and true 
uh, type of ride. It literally is almost like a criterion that goes around and around and around. Uh, people know it. People have been doing it for years. And this is the one time where they can see the professional riders basically do the Rose Bowl ride, which is great. Also, the women were coming in just before the men and they were duking it out for the last couple of days. Uh, we caught the women's race because they finished before the men and we were able to talk to some of them. It's finally over. Talk about sort of how the last three days went for you. Oh, well, it's certainly been a uh, dynamic racing. Um, I actually really enjoyed today. I, I mean, I had a pretty good ride yesterday, but I, I wasn't super satisfied with how I approached that climb yesterday. I think I could have got a bit more out of myself, but I mean, today was just super fun. Like it really, it was really, really aggressive from the start. And, you know, there was a, a good group, a good breakaway, which I was in. And for me, I, that felt pretty positive in case it did stay away. Cause uh, I don't think there was any other GC riders in there, except for maybe Omi. But yeah, just great racing and super aggressive and a really awesome course. And the crowds were great. And like, we're just uh, happy to all be in one piece. And um, yeah bring on a few more days I reckon. <laughs> do, do you still think after you know three hard stages that uh, the Tour of California needs to have more stages for the women? Yeah more climbing stages more 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 more. <laughs> <laughs> Great and so you finished overall in GC uh, sixth? Uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll, I'll check the emails All right. and send those. Congratulations thanks. Thanks it's been fun. That was Brody Chapman of Australia who rides for the Tibco team and confirming, yes, she did finish in sixth overall in general classification, one minute and 46 seconds back behind the winner world champion Anna Vanderbregen of the Bulls Domans team. So the women's team had the best female riders in the world and they brought it. They brought it to California and they really stepped up their game. All the riders from the Americans to the Europeans, the Italians, there's a Mexican team, the Astana team. There was there were so many good women's riders. Unfortunately, not enough coverage as always and that's why we decided to go out there and talk to some of them next up is always a favorite uh, team for us to follow and that is the rally team the rally cats we talked to uh, Sarah Bergen who I met at the uh, beginning of the team camp in January during their team lunch in Calabasas got to ride with her there and she is always a force to be reckoned with she got 10th on the stage uh, coming into Pasadena. She's a high-powered rider, good sprinter, and quite a friendly Canadian. So it's finally over. Let's talk about, first of all, not the entire thing, but just the stage today. Yeah. Rose Bowl, a few laps around it. Uh, how did it go for you as, it, as the Ks were winding down? Um, we were in somewhat of like the Goldilocks spot, and what I mean was like other teams were chasing really hard, and just just given our GC position, like we were like protecting Krista's GC, so we kind of had to gamble a bit and let them do the work, which they did. And then just like, first of all, the Rose Bowl is awesome. Yeah. Good, good turnout, but yeah, just surf wheels and like, like I had to be further up, and I just got caught caught in the washing machine, like coming out of the last corner, but was still able to make up some space, you know, and shoot some wheels through there, but obviously we would have liked a bit more there, but after a hard day and a really, really hard week, like, I'm pretty pleased with that. Yeah. yeah. Were you guys working well together once you, you were sort of away, or? Yeah, so the group that went away, like, there was a big split, maybe, I want to say, like, just 40k in, like, a pretty big split, and the same thing, like, we had, like, some pretty high-up GC riders, so just given that, like, we had, like, Brody from Tipco, and she's coming off a huge win at Gila, so I was pretty much, it was like, no, like, you need to just pretty much tend, tend to the break and conserve energy as much as possible, which, mm -hmm. <clears throat> for me, like, is probably the best it could have played, because I got some, like, like some lead-in into that, into that first QOM, and then was able to kind of, <laughs> through skin and freaking tooth and nail, <laughs> hold on and get it together on the downhill so yeah do you i mean you've had three hard days of racing do you ever think that the tour of california needs more stages for the women absolutely um i think today is a great example like we had a total equality in, in terms of this stage and like i really don't need like a 300 kilometer day but i think you know like, like give us the seven stages and with the the recent announcement of the tour of the north which is the the 
kind of conglomeration of Tour of Norway, um, Valgarde, yeah. and a couple of Swedish races. So, stages, yeah, think. that is super exciting. And I kind of just want to, you know, encourage, like, like Tour of California. Like, yeah, it's going to be a great race. And you guys can also, like, lead in the world and, and show what women can do. And, like, the world-class field here is just kind of, like, a testament to how exciting the racing really will be. Like, over seven stages, like, you know, it's not going to be over in the first day. Yeah. Yeah, it's fantastic, and just having like you know, like like Van der Bregen here, and like just such a deep field, like it's a true honor to race. All right, thanks so much. Congrats. <laughs> Thank you for your time. <laughs> people always forget the last thing that professional riders want to do is talk to people right after an extremely hard ride, almost eighty miles, five thousand feet of climbing, more more than five thousand, as well as you know, really, really pushing it to their absolute limit, the last twenty kilometers. So while they're trying to get fluids down. Uh, I do appreciate getting a couple of interviews here and there. Next up, we talk to Chloe Digart. She rides for Team 2020 and is well-known on the track. She's a world champion team pursuiter for Team USA, and she can close. She has a great finishing kick, uh, and she finished fourth on the last stage. It came down to a pack sprint. Everybody was looking for Corinne Rivera, but she was nowhere to be found because she had a mechanical and had to coast in. So other riders capitalized on that, and Chloe Digert was right there in the mix. We talked to her at the finish as well. Chloe Digert, congrats on finishing Tour of California. How did it go for you this year? Yeah, you know, it went uh, pretty well. I was definitely really nervous coming back here this year after what happened last year. Um, so yeah, actually the first day I was... Uh, probably more nervous for a race than I've ever been like actually during the race so um, fighting for position being in good position was uh, really hard and I was just kind of mentally drained for the finish so really didn't have anything for that day um, the second day um, I think I was just kind of upset with my performance on the first day and just wasn't where I needed to be on that base of the climb and just lost the front group and uh, so try to take it easy easy but as hard as I could possibly go to make time cut and still be okay for today um, yeah so today was a little bit better I'm still kind of um, getting my confidence back to be back in the peloton again um, but yeah you know I uh, did whatever I could to be up there for the sprint um, still not quite confident enough to yet to hold my own so uh, definitely didn't work out how we wanted it to, but it was it was really good to get the experience and the uh, confidence back to hopefully keep going. And uh, yeah, so the team the team did really well. Uh, Emma did so well yesterday, getting top ten. Jasmine, Allie, uh, Erica, Jen, we all worked really well together, and it's a super strong team. So really looking forward to the rest of the season with the girls. Yeah. Uh I've been asking a lot of the women this. Do you think Tour of California should be more than just three stages? You know, I uh, would love a time trial. That's right, there's no TT. <laughs> yeah. You're pretty good at time trials. Yeah, I love time trials. You know, and I actually was talking to Ian's boy yesterday, and we had uh, talked about putting uh, a uh, course around a velodrome or something, have a little little piece of around Maybe the like finish on the like finish or style. yeah yeah oh for sure or ride around it come out and you know <laughs> finish, start and yeah do a bunch of laps yeah, yeah yeah go out and then finish there again. we go yeah, that sounds good laps. yeah so i um you know i i think it's um super exciting to you know have this race in this event um but yeah i think adding a time trial and maybe a few more stages that aren't so hilly for me um would be great <laughs> awesome congrats thank you so much the Hoggins Berman Super Mint team were a little bit of an underdog team, but man, they cleaned up. We talked to the workhorse of the team, Liza Raketo, who uh, finished 70th, 30 minutes and 27 seconds back, but she was really working for her teammates. We talked to her about her experience at Tour of California. Okay. Yeah, and then Jess had the first significant break of the day with one of the riders, and then we kind of rolled through the neighborhood, so it was slightly up and down, and it was pretty much on from the gun and then before the hills got a bit steeper I had a small attack and we had a separation and then was there Lily, a plan to Lily was in a break okay for a significant amount of time which was great so was there a plan to launch attacks relentlessly or, or so go the tricky with part groups? yeah Brian is a lot of things that could happen today and with the climbing and the hills our goal was to try to make it aggressive even though 
maybe it wouldn't work out to our favor, but it's better than just finishing in a group or groupetto without having tried something. Right. And all of us really gave a good shot at that when you had a great attack. So it sort of established itself later in the race. And I think one of the most exciting things is that we had two riders at the finish, able to do a lead out. It's a little bit early, but finishing on the podium at this race is huge. Getting world tour points. Yeah, representing our sponsors. We have a number of sponsors in SoCal, which is fantastic. Yeah. So I'm asking all the women this, should this race be more than three stages? Depends. I think if they're into this equality thing, they might do five and five. Um, so it should have, could have started on stage one in yeah. Sacramento. Yeah, like five men. stages for the men, five for the women, maybe. Right. But, the, you know, of course, the duration, we're not going to be able to raise 220K. Right. It's just not realistic. Um, but I'm, for me, I think it's such an improvement, even over last year, that we have three challenging stages. Mm. Hilly stages, hard racing, some of the best teams brought their best riders, and that was huge. Awesome. Yeah. So what's your big takeaway from having this, another, you know, this Tour of California under your belt? <laughs> I don't know if I want to do any more of these. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't supposed to be here. <laughs> <laughs> you did it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, congrats. Thank you. <laughs> Next, we talked to one of the overall contenders for GC. That is Taylor Wilde. She rides for this Trek Segafredo team, and she finished in 11th overall, which is great. And the other thing is she's the third highest placed American behind Katie Hall and Krista Doble Hickok. She finished... Like I said, in 11th, only 2 minutes and 32 seconds down, and we caught up with her. Good, good. <laughs> Taylor Wiles, uh, you were at the end of just completing Tour of California. How did the three stages go for you this year? Uh, they were really hard. We're a little disappointed because we didn't get a podium this year, but we raced really well as a team, and sometimes it just doesn't come together. How did the Baldy stage work for you yesterday, and how did that sort of affect your your legs today in in a mostly you know one climb third category and then basically a crit at the end yeah yeah baldy was brutal it was really hard because the last bit is pretty steep and it was full gas and today is a lot harder than the profile made it look as yeah it said there was one third category climb but it was up pretty much all day up or down up or straight down um, and then yeah just like a crit at the end it was a little bit anticlimactic for how hard of a race it actually was uh do you feel that tour california needs more than three stages uh definitely i would love to have a tour just like the men have like at least five days you know with the time trial and four proper stages would be awesome and, and that's the other thing, no time trial this year for the ladies and the men. How does that factor into your performance? Well, for me, it's big because I'm a time trialist, and they just keep taking them out of our stage races, so it just gives the pure climbers a little bit more of an advantage. Mm -hmm. All right, what's next in the future for you? I fly tonight to Bilbao, and I start racing in um, two days. Right. Not that you're not already busy, but no. <laughs> good luck. Thank you. For the men, they started this last stage about an hour, hour and a half after the women. And it was a huge stage for them. Pojakar, today Pojakar, uh, he, all he had to do was hang on to the GC lead and not let anything get away. He's on the UAE team and they did exactly that. There was an early break that was established. And when they hit the Rose Bowl, the early break that contained about four riders got reeled in and it came down to a drag race right at the end. If you saw it on TV from the helicopter shot, you could see the favorite, Sagan. Uh, Travis McCabe was in their surfing wheels by himself and sort of fighting for a position between the lead out from CCC as well as some of the other teams. But it came down to a full-on drag race with a crash at the end by another UAE rider, Portuguese rider. But it was pretty much Sagan and Case Bull who came down to a drag race. And Case Bull is a huge rider for CCC. He's over six feet tall and does not look like a super skinny climber cyclist. He can put out power. He can put out, you know, high uh, thousands of watts of power, uh, maybe 2,000 watts if I had to guess. But he edged out Sagan for the win. And then the finish was absolutely chaotic. Um, we tried to catch up with a couple riders at the end, and here's the best part. 
If you've ever raced a crit in SoCal or elsewhere and things don't go your way, a lot of times you argue, you talk to the rider that wronged you. If you got cut off, if a rider was acting dangerous, you'll tell them about it. One thing I noticed is that's no different in pro racing. And I noticed an Ineos rider talk to one of the quick step riders. I'm not going to say who, but they were full on having it out. And I decided to turn my microphone on. Yeah. And then we keep pulling and you come in and try and take it. I, 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 don't, I, 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 so I, I, I try to slow you down. That's true. Yeah. But I, it. It, in, in the that's end, it. okay, maybe, but that's racing. But what, what, what I'm really sorry for is that it wasn't a date. Yeah. 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 When we pull, yeah. 40k, yeah. Thank you, man. Yeah. and then you come inside yeah. and try yeah, and slow down. Yeah, I was just, yeah, See that? The pros are not that much different from us amateurs. Not to mention, I nearly got run over by an overzealous motorcycle. The thing about the finish line is it's pure chaos because... It's open to the public. The riders are finishing. They're trying to figure out where their team buses are. The Swaniers have all their recovery aid, food, and drinks. The fans are trying to get in there. And I've said this before. Here's a pro tip. If you are ever at a pro bike race and you want to see the riders, all you have to do is follow wherever the Swaniers go because the riders meet them. So you look at the backpacks they're carrying. You look at the team shirts they're carrying if you if you really want to get a glimpse and the thing is you got to be respectful you know these riders are exhausted after finishing i mean i do a hard ride i don't want to talk to anybody you know all i want to do is put food in my mouth when i get home and that's at home so these riders they do this after every stage of every race in california the fans are just relentless in a good way i mean cycling needs a little bit of fandom and that's one of the things uh, i tried to get to even get a glimpse of Sagan and everywhere he went, he was swarmed with people. I mean, he got second on the stage, but he could have gotten last and it wouldn't have made a difference because people just gravitate towards him. There is something called the Sagan effect. And he's such a popular figure, not only in cycling, but especially in California that people go to him. So at the beginning of the show, we talked to that writer who basically questioned me. What I didn't tell you was he grabbed my lanyard, looked at it, and read it. And when I introduced myself and I said, hey, I'm from Veloworthy, he sounded, okay, that sounds legit. Let's go ahead and do the interview. And that happens to be Nathan Haas of the Katusha Alpeson team. To the race. How, did, how did the finish Who go? am I talking to? Uh, Brian Coe, Veloworthy. Um, how, did, how did the last... 10k it seemed pretty chaotic back there how did it how did it run out uh, to be honest that was pretty chill that was a nice circuit you know it's nice when people don't put death corners in and right. stupid road furniture and everything that was a super final nice way to actually finish the week I and mean, we all we all wanted a sprint today uh -huh. peloton but they had to put a few insane climbs before that so i don't think the mood was super happy in the bunch but you know, now it's all done i think everyone's pretty stoked how, how do the legs feel after baldy yesterday i mean baldy stage is not actually so hard to be honest the, the worst stage in cycling i think is the one up to tahoe uh -huh. i feel you know i don't want to complain too much but i think it's completely unnecessary to go up that high and sit there for so long because you know there's altitude races like utah and colorado that everyone goes and prepares for right. but if you've been just doing the classics and at sea level for the last four months I mean, it, it, it's just ridiculous. The, the riders who are just good at altitude are the ones that go well, and, and some guys that suffer at it, you know, they don't come good for the whole week. So I think Tahoe is just totally unnecessarily hard. Was it was a time trial unnecessary this year? Yeah, not having one. Not having one. Oh, I, it's sort of neither here or there. It's nice to have a time trial for guys that are time trialists. Right. You know, the, I think the way the season's looking is there's just not that many on the on the calendar and then you know when you have a guy like Rowan Dennis grace the race with his presence you know uh, it's something that you know the fans enjoy to see as a world champion you know competing on on their soil in an actual time trial and you know it's just a missed opportunity to see the stripes and and see some world-class performances but from my perspective it doesn't really change the race that much because 
you know, maybe a couple of things in the top three change. But uh, yeah, time trialing is, you know, it seems like it's sort of being phased out of a lot of races yeah. this year. Maybe not next year, but certainly this year. Easy on the mechanics. Sorry. All right, mm. we'll, let you, we'll let you get back to it. Congrats. You made the beaters on YouTube? If I could sort of geek out for a second, I talked to my personal favorite, uh, one of my personal favorite, I have a lot of favorites, but personal favorite rider of the race, Zednik Stebar. Uh, he's a former pro world champion cyclocross racer. And I don't know if you've been paying attention to some of, some of the spring classics, but cyclocross riders are doing pretty well on the road. He's one that seemed to have a good transition to a full-time road career. He rides for the Dennis at Quick Step team, and he's always on the attack. He's always working. He's always in the wind working for his team. And his team did really well. They won three stages, almost four. And we caught up with him at the team bus. Uh, Tour of California is finally finished. How did it go for you this year? Uh, it was uh, pretty okay. It was, uh, I think as a team, it uh, could not be much uh, much better. Um, so with, uh, with the winning stages and uh, third in GC with Casper. So yeah, it was, uh, was a really nice race. Very hard also with a lot of climb, uh, with many climbs and uh, many kilometers. So I think uh, like it was uh, like, let's say the perfect start after the classic season. Any, any plans for the rest of the season? Are you going to be doing any of the Grand Tours? Uh, yeah, normally yes, and, uh, but I don't know yet which one. Uh, how did the legs feel after Baldi yesterday? Yeah, that's still okay, but like, you know, today it was uh, maybe the hardest stage. Uh, today? Ma yeah, maybe not on the profile, but because it was, uh, uh, it was short, so it was very intense. And uh, I think, you know, the organizers, sometimes they just put their unnes unnecessarily uh, such a long stages. Uh -huh. But uh, it doesn't make the race more attractive, you know, like their, uh, the stage like today, that was attractive, that was, that was racing. Not, uh, not like yesterday or the days before when we do more than 200 kilometers, nobody is even able to, to just go, you know, from far. And so today it was open race and it uh, was very interesting, I think. So yeah, was, uh, today was really tough. And last, do you think more people like uh, Vanderpol and Wout Van Aert need to do more road racing? You come from a cyclocross background. And yeah, but they do already many road races, so uh, I don't think they have to do more. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Steve, our, as a worker in the race, he finished 53rd, 39 minutes back, uh, but really doing so much effort for the team. Next up, we talked to sort of the American start and standout of the sprinters, Travis McCabe of the Team USA composite team. He rides for Floyds of Leadville, but obviously their team didn't qualify, and he finished way back on stage one. I would say you're definitely more well-known after the race than before. How did it go for you this week? I mean, I couldn't really ask for much better other than a victory. Um, <laughs> I think, oh, I think it was a complete and total success with everyone on the team. I mean, we had six guys, seven guys start, six guys finish, a man in the break every day, the best young riders jersey, the KOM jersey, the most courageous jersey. Uh, I got to wear a sprint jersey for a day, a second place. And, uh, you know, for a small team like this, that's usually more than you can ask for on these races because it's such a high caliber. These are guys who are prepping for the Tour de France. So to be able to uh, come out here and get those results and showcase uh, the young American talent that we have and also represent USA Cycling in America's Big Stage Race is pretty special. It's something that you don't really get to do very often. And it's the first thing we've, first time they've done this in 12 years. So, um, yeah, I mean, total success. Everyone's happy, everyone's smiling, everyone is just uh, on cloud nine right now. Was it harder not having your trade team teammates and just sort of a composite? Not really. I mean, the composite teams, uh, you know everyone who's racing, so it's such a small psych like community that you know a lot of people, and uh, you've, I've raced against a few of these guys before, or raced with them, and then always raced against them. So it's like you know everyone, and I think it meshed right away. There were no egos involved. Everyone was out here doing their job, trying to do what they needed to do, and 
um, you saw that with the results that we got. So there was nothing, you know, no, it doesn't affect us at all. Like we came here to race bikes and you, you know, everyone's here to represent USA Cycling and that's what we did and yeah. All right, thank you. Happy belated birthday. Thanks. <laughs> And fun fact for Travis, on stage one in Sacramento, he had celebrated his 30th birthday. He's getting old. <laughs> Just kidding. And uh, that gave him a little bit of extra motivation uh, for stage one. And he was oh so close catching Peter Sagan, another sprinter we caught up with after the race, who, who was a little bit tired, but again, Huge fan favorite, favorite of mine. Uh, he rides for Trek Segafredo, John Deckenkolb. He won a stage of the Tour de France last year, and it was it was one of the most impressive stage wins I've ever seen. It was on that cobbled stage uh, that looked like sort of a classic mixed into the rest of the tour. This year, he uh, kind of kept a low profile Tour of California, finishing up there, but went winless without a stage win. Oh. I mean, uh, it's not uh, the kind of day I, I enjoy a lot, but uh, um, I, I did my best and uh, was was uh, pretty okay. Um, uh, today was also really, really hard again, really hard racing today. Were you going for the stage win today? Yeah, I tried, but of course, but... Uh, were, you I, weren't involved in the crash, were you? I was actually held up uh, behind it, um, uh, and that was, uh, yeah, a little bit shit. Okay. Yeah. And then, uh, what's next on the calendar for you in the future? Um, I will race in uh, in uh, Holland, uh, Hammer Limburg, okay. and uh, then Tour Switzerland. Are you? Do you know if you are uh, prepping for the Tour de France? We will see. I, I hope so, and uh, I think my, my shape is, is is good and on a good level. But um, uh, it's still a long way to the Tour. Okay. Thank you very thank much. You. And lastly, we talked to Rowan Dennis, uh, who's Nathan Haas was talking about earlier. He is the current world time trial champion. He's Australian from the Bahrain Merida team, and he finished 11th in this race, only a minute 23 back. And we got his sort of final thoughts on the race. Uh, it was fun. Good training week. Uh, had a bit more, I was a bit more active this year uh, than other years. I thought there was, I couldn't really rely on a TT to really back my GC up um, so I had to try uh, getting some moves and make some friends by doing that uh, they didn't really appreciate it but you know I was trying to win it but uh, all in all always a good race what's sort of the biggest takeaway you have coming off a week of racing in the States uh, form is better than I expected really yeah uh, <laughs> are you are you still planning on uh, doing some grand tours I'm doing the, the Tour de France this year um, and potentially the Vuelta as well. Okay. Uh, but I'm not doing them for, for GC. Uh, I've got to look after Nibley in the, in the Tour de France and the Vuelta, I'll be using that for preparation for Worlds. Okay. Thank you very much. No worries, thank you. So there are a couple of big takeaways from this year's Amgen Tour of California. First of all, Tadej Pojakar, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that correctly. That is going to be a writer to watch for the future. Same thing with Anna Vanderbregen. She's more established. She's current world champion on the road. Uh, she won the race, and they both won a pair of Lexuses as one of the title sponsors of the race. But yeah, he is a writer for the future. Um, former, you know, future stage racer. He's going to be former champ forever, so he'll always be a writer to watch. Second thing is the fans. The devotion it takes for a cycling fan to see the riders for 10 seconds or 30 seconds, or if you're up on the mountain stage for maybe a couple of minutes, and the effort it takes and the time it takes to make your way to navigate. It's not like you can go to a stadium and watch the whole thing play out. So the fans were huge. And the sheer numbers of fans and cyclists that rode their bikes to the race, in their kits, up the mountains, down the mountains, that's really important. Also, it cannot be understated, the Sagan effect. I was looking around at all the RVs, they were all the same. Uh, it's hard to make out the race team logos on the side because there are these small little stickers that they put on there. But I knew which 
RV had Sagan in it because so many people were camped out just waiting for a glimpse, a selfie, an autograph. And Sagan, God bless him, like he, you know, he'd pop out and he would sign as much as he could and pose for as many pictures as he would, as he could and got on his bike and people would be running after him, chasing him. And, you know, like I said, he could have not won any stages and he's just that much of a superstar. Also, one thing I noticed is uh, Corinne Rivera. She had a huge entourage. Her parents had this massive RV, huge barbecue, Filipino style. Her friends, her family, they had T-shirts, Team Rivera. Uh, And it's, you know, it finishes in Southern California. It's her her home roads. uh, And it's almost a reunion with that. So she had a big following as well. Unfortunately, the last stage did not go her way. But she's the current national champion, as well as a classics winner in Europe, writing for the Sun Web team. And then, lastly, for me, it was seeing sort of familiar faces, uh, meeting people, seeing seeing old friends that I don't normally get to see. I only see them at bike races, and even some of the other journalists. I think you know I know them more than they know me. And the thing about it is when you're at each stage, you get to use like the media room and you see these old school and established journalists from some of the bigger websites and the bigger names. They're hammering away on their computers because they've got to make deadlines. I put deadlines on myself. Uh, This stage race is super important to California as well as the United States. It's basically America's sort of version of the Tour de France. So uh, for a lot of fans and journalists and industry people, it is the one time of year they can actually see their cycling heroes up close and in person. The rest of the year, they watch it on TV just like everybody else. And in Europe, if you're lucky enough to go, yeah, you can see it there. But good luck trying to get close to the riders. I mean, the security is so much tighter here. It's a little bit more relaxed. Yes, there are a ton more Uh, There's a lot more space and the roads are wider to race on, but the riders, you know, this is their work and this is their job. And part of their job is interacting with people after the race. Uh, I don't know if you know, but a lot of the riders at the final stage, so the stage in Pasadena had to do all these meet and greets at different bike shops and things like that. So their actual work doesn't end until they get back to the hotel or they go back to their house and they get to sleep it out and crash out or do whatever and then recover and then go race again in a couple days. So it is a very, very tough life. But my big takeaway is I am no field journalist. I know that. I can. I am not one to... Uh, play rugby with other fans and journalists. I am much more comfortable in the studio, but who knows? Maybe I'll have one of the World Tour writers come into the studio and we can have a long form, deep dive sit down. And also I just, another takeaway is I just don't want to push myself and sacrifice my own health as I, as I got sick during this uh, event. But it, like I said, it was so huge, such a big thing. And every year it seems to get bigger and bigger and bigger, bigger and attracting more talent. I want to know what you thought. If you were there at the race, if you saw it on TV, what were some of your takeaways? Let me know, brian at veloworthy.com. Also, if you want to see pictures from the race, I've posted a bunch of different galleries and, and videos I took on Facebook. And then also, if you want to see some of the really cool shots I took on Instagram, check out at Veloworthy, and then Facebook is also Veloworthy. But until next time, this is Brian Co. for every single person I talk to at the tour of California, special shout out to Alan Lim, who basically was my escort all throughout the process. Uh, He took me around and introduced me to people and things like that. So a special shout out to him. This is Brian Coe saying, stay Velo worthy.